So we're going to be moving on today to the Buddha's going forth after his experience of the uh, four sights yesterday. Um, I'm quite aware that um, when I've um, done stuff around the going forth in the past, it, it's, a, it's quite an emotive um, subject for some people. Some people can find it quite um, quite triggering. Um, I think, if, especially if you've experienced the uh, breakup of your parents' relationship, or you've been involved in the breakdown of a relationship yourself. So I'm aware it's quite it's quite a strong subject in a way. But we'll um, hopefully unpack it a little this morning. But just to acknowledge that. Um, so. Let's begin. We we left Gotama yesterday, having experienced the four sights. He had returned to the palace, uh, deeply sort of troubled. Strange combination of deeply troubled by the experience of witnessing old age, sickness, and death for the first time. Uh, but also inspired by seeing a wandering ascetic that there is a possibility. But he's returned to his old life and he's, uh, his father is concerned about him, as parents often are, and redoubles his efforts to provide more pleasure and entertainment and distraction for his young son. And he, some say he even uh, built the walls even higher around the palace to protect his, uh, his son from the uh, harsh realities of the outside world. But Gotama becomes increasingly troubled, increasingly uneasy. Um, some say he is uh, one of the... Uh, one of the courtesans in the palace singing a song of Nirvana, a song of freedom and liberation, and that's what stirs him even further. But his the tension builds within within him until finally he decides he has no choice but to change his life. Uh, this isn't an easy decision. Um, he's got a wife and a child and all the responsibilities of the heir to the kingdom. But his, the tension in him grows to this sort of unbearable pitch and he decides that he has no choice but to go forth, to, to leave the world behind and to become a wandering ascetic himself because he's um, the whole countryside is full of these spiritual seekers who are meditating and practicing and debating and discussing, trying to find the meaning of life, cessation of suffering. So one night uh, with his faithful groom, Shanda, uh, Gotama silently leaves the palace. Some say he... Uh, he goes back for one last look at his uh, sleeping wife and child. He doesn't want anyone to know that he's leaving. And he silently slips away. And some say that uh, the gods help him, that the, his horse's hooves are lifted above the ground by the devas and the spirits so as to not to wake anyone. And a, and a hush comes over the whole palace and everyone's in a very deep fairy tale sleep and the the gates of the palace silently swing open on their own accord and Gotama and Chana and his faithful horse Katanka they leave and the devas and the spirits help them magically fly across the nearby river 
to the other shore. And on the other shore, Gotama takes off his royal garments and some say he swapped them with uh, Chana's clothes. Some say he swapped them with a passing hunter, the rags of a passing very poor hunter. Or some say the, uh, the gods themselves provided him with the robes of a wandering ascetic. And Chana is the, uh, the groom is deeply saddened to see his, uh, his master leave and is grief stricken. And it's said that the horse is so grief stricken that the horse dies of a broken heart to see Gotama go. And Gotama heads off into the forest on his own in the night to begin his life as a wandering spiritual seeker. So that's where we're going to leave the story today. Um, and we'll explore, explore that sequence of events for the rest of today. Um, first off, as you can see from my telling, there's, there's many different versions of Gotama's leaving of the palace. Um, it's very interesting that in, in some accounts, um, he's very young. Um, he's a youth with coal black hair. There's not, there's not a grey hair in there. Um, and there's no mention of, of a family at all. He's, he, he leaves as a single man. And in those accounts, they, they vary as well in that um, he could leave with his father's blessing. Um, his father's actually quite happy for him to go. <laughs> um, he, he also, in another version, his father and stepmother um, uh, have tear-filled eyes to see him go, and there's even sort of suggestion there's some sort of arguing that goes on before he leaves. Um, there's also the suggestion that he lives with... Um, many wives and, and a kind of harem of, of courtesans. So there's these, these very, very different um, sort of domestic setups that, the, uh, that Gotama is, is, is leaving behind. Um, and I think it is, we, we really don't know what the actual reality of the situation was, but I think with, it, it, it is very important to realise that the whole notion of family um, was a very, very different notion of the sort of Western nuclear family, um, as is still uh, the situation today in India and in much of the, the world. Um, there would have been a very, very large extended family all living together. And um, the relationships in those may have involved multiple partners. Um, it's worth noting that Gautama's father married his uh, deceased wife's sister, so uh, Gautama's stepmother was the sister of his mother. Um, so it's a very, very different sort of um, notion of, of family. And we I think when we're looking at the past, it's always very important to realise we're always looking at the past through the lens of the present, through our own views, our own values of the present. It's that was it, the past is another country. It really is. So it's worth bearing that in mind. There's also a suggestion that this story, um, particularly the, the the leaving of the the wife and child, was was cut with was added later. It doesn't, it doesn't appear in the earlier versions. And particularly the, the naming of um, Gautama's son as Rahula, which actually means fetter, which um, 
it's a fairly harsh thing, name to give to one's child. Um, so there's a suggestion that the story is a kind of um, bit of uh, monastic propaganda, um, a, a sort of recruitment drive to uh, to join the monastic community. So, yeah, it's worth bearing all that all that in mind when, when we when we look at this story, when we look at this. But one of the things that really affects me when I when I reflect on uh, the going forth is to me, and this this is completely personal. Is I have a sense of a man in a deep, deep existential crisis, who's who's kind of almost been torn in two in a way. Um, he's had this experience of the four sights. He's he's had an experience of a, of, of a possibility beyond beyond suffering that there might be a, a way forward, and he's completely torn between his responsibilities, possibly as a, as a as a husband and father, but certainly as a son and heir. And yet, at the same time, he's had this experience. And uh, there's a, a short sutta called the Atadana Sutta. And it's quite early and it's very sort of poetic and it's written in the sort of first person. So it's written from Gotama's perspective. And it describes this experience of, of what he was feeling at the time. And, it's, and it says, um, I'll put this on the padlet to the full text. Um, but the sutta says, and this is Gotama speaking, I'll tell you about the dreadful fear that caused me to shake all over, seeing creatures flopping around like fish in water too shallow, so hostile to one another. Seeing this, I became afraid. And the sutta goes on to describe how... Um, Gotama has an image of that there's a thorn in the heart that needs to be removed, a thorn. It's a very strong graphic image, a thorn in the heart. Um, so that's quite an interesting, slightly different angle I experience. That there's this sense of Gotama looking around and seeing the suffering of existence, seeing people flopping around like fish in water too shallow. They're such strong images. Um, seeing the, the kind of the human condition and how, and the suffering of it, and just how painful it is. Um, yeah, there's, um, Bodhi Paksha wrote, wrote a book recently called This Difficult Thing Being Human, I think it's called, This Difficult Thing Being Human. And it is, it is very hard. <laughs> It is very, very hard. Um, and the whole story, in a sense, the whole going forth is, is an illustration of the, the thorn in the heart of, of attachment, of, of, of the way that our craving um, leads to our suffering. The, the fact that we struggle with uh, the fact that things are impermanent they're insubstantial and they're unsatisfactory. Um, and we kind of fight against that, as, as, um, as I was saying yesterday. Uh, but I think the really important thing to bear in mind is that what we, this non-attachment, this, this going forth, is, is the going forth really... Um, it's, it's a non-attachment to verbs rather than nouns, as I put it. Um, we, we can always literalise these things, but it's, it's, the, it's how we relate to things, not, not what we're relating to. It's how we relate to the world. Um, and that's quite a difficult and subtle thing to grasp. Because um, I think it's also really worth remembering that there, there's also... Uh, what Sanger actually called the path of responsibility, 
that this is a story of sort of moving from a sense of confinement to to literally from the confinement of the walls of the palace. I've I've illustrated this by putting our our avatar of of uh, of Gautama in his in his house shaped cage on the shrine. Um, so in the story, there's this momentum, this this journey, quite literally from the confines of the, the palace, the uh, cramped indeed, the dusty sphere as it's described, cramped indeed, the dusty sphere. But there's this movement to something more spacious. But it's also worth remembering that there is this path of responsibility, uh, which is, you know, uh, where we really take on responsibility for the other, um, particularly, say, for example, becoming a parent. And there's a, there's a real, as any of you will know who are parents, there is a real selflessness um, required in that as well. Because ultimately, uh, we're talking about going beyond a fixed sense of self. And there are, and there are different paths to go beyond that. Um, fixed sense of self and that's the real significant journey that we all need to undertake but those those journeys will be very different for very different people so it's not always the case of literally leaving home um, it is for some people um, for other people it's more of a sense of uh, working within the situations we find ourselves in because I think one of, the, one of the fundamentals messages I feel of this is the fact that we all have a finite amount of time and energy and we need to make wise choices about what we do with our time and energy. Um, we have this uh, myth, particularly in the modern West, about having it all. You know, you can do, there's time enough for everything you, you can do. Um, I think I might be wrong, but I, I wonder, particularly at the current climate, whether, um, particularly for women, actually, there's this sort of notion that you've, um, you know, you've got four children, you're, um, you're running your own incredibly successful business, um, you're doing yoga six times a day, probably, and you're getting up at five o'clock in the morning to bake your own organic sourdough bread. Um, there's this sort of strange notion that you can sort of do everything and lead this sort of incredible life, and you're probably getting enlightened at the same time. Um, you, you see this sort of in the media, all these people living these incredible perfect lives where, you know, there's time to do everything. And there isn't enough time to do everything. We have to make difficult decisions in this life. Um, and the going forth, I think, really really makes this starkly aware that we may, we need to make difficult decisions. And those decisions are, are often quite painful. Um, there's the, the, yeah, it's tough. It's tough. There's no two ways about it. It's tough. I'll say more about that in a moment. But there's also I think it's interesting, once, once Gautam has made this decision, um, there's this sort of soup, he decides to leave, which is obviously, I don't think, an easy decision at all for him to do. But I almost think, God, you know, the, 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 the tension that must have been in, inside him for him to have to make that, make that decision. It's quite extraordinary. Um, and then he silently leaves in the dead of night. Um, I think it's always an interesting question: how, how do we leave a situation? Do, do we um, do we creep away in the dead of night? Do we do we do we depart after an argument? Do we depart with tears? Um, yeah, we've probably all got our different um, styles of uh, of uh, walking away when we need to. But I find it interesting that in this, in the way it's it's told in this kind of fairy tale kind of account of the horse being kind of lifted and the palace being asleep and the gates opening and the horse being carried over the river. There's this sense of um, 
I was going to use the phrase entering the stream, not not literally, as in this is the moment he becomes a stream entrant, but there's this sense of kind of, um, there's a flow, there, there, there's a sense of fluidity, there's a sense of um, uh, the world somehow being with our actions. And, and I certainly experienced this myself in my own life. But there's definitely times in my life where it feels like I'm, the wind's behind me. There, there's a sense of things kind of slot into place. And there's other times where everything feels wrong and it feels really hard work and nothing's. And often that for me is a, a, a it kind of, well, it makes me reflect on what, what's going on. Um, it's kind of a little bit of a clue, I find, um, as, to, as to what is really going on. I, am I missing something here? But there's a sense of sort of almost um, rightness, I suppose. I suppose it's almost like a blessing. I've, I experience this almost like a sort of blessing. These beings assisting the uh, Gautama as, as almost a kind of blessing. Um, and you might have experienced this yourself, this kind of um, synchronicities, auspicious signs, things happening. I mean, Sankara actually talked about this... Um, whole series of rainbows, um, the Rainbow Road, he named one of, his, one of his volumes of memoirs after it, about when he went forth, there was a whole series of rainbows over the, literally over the road. <laughs> it was definitely the, the Hollywood directors got in on that one, I think. Um, and the, what an amazing image, what an amazing image. Um, but I, I was saying yesterday about the um, extraordinary set of synchronicities that, that led me to become involved with Buddhism. And I look back on that, I still, you know, how did that happen? It almost feels quite magical, actually. It almost feels quite, quite, quite magical. But you might have experienced that in your life in, in big or small ways. Sometimes the magic can be quite mundane. Um, but these little kind of things that assist us upon the, upon the way, a chance meeting. Um, and they might be, they might be uh, really incongruous. Um, yeah, quite, quite extraordinary in a way. Um, so, Gautama travels over the over the river to the, to, to the other shore. And again, such a significant image, going to the other shore. Um, he's cr and, the, and the river, of course, is a threshold. Uh, it's got that sense of sort of crossing the Rubicon, you know. It's, uh, it's going over to the other side. It's going, and it's going from the palace to the forest. In, in a lot of um, fairy tales, there's this motif of going from the court, from, from the sort of order and etiquette, and decorum and structure of, of the court or the castle, out into the wild forest. Um, this move from kind of structure, law, confinement, uh, duty, responsibility, to the forest where there's a certain amount of freedom uh, there isn't the same etiquette, there isn't the same expectation. But there's also a sense of um, fear, that the forest is a place of fear. There's, there's literally, as, as the image says, there's, um, there's these walls around the palace that, that keep it safe, that, that keep the wild animals out. And Gautama is going to that wild place, the place... Because if you really think about it, the... Um, Dense jungle in northern India two and a half thousand years ago was a pretty dangerous place to be. Um, and again, um, I was saying a few minutes ago about um, how we, we view the past from the lens of the present. Uh, in, in our culture, we view nature as being quite benign, don't we? we I'm sorry, generalising here, but... Uh, but certainly in Britain, in 
the 21st century nature scene as something fairly benign, you know, and you, you go from the danger, interesting, it's almost the reverse, isn't it? You go from the danger of the, 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 the city, the, the, you know, the, the, the dark streets of the city to, to kind of comforting nature. Um, but, but in the past, um, the town was considered the safe place to be, you know, the, 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 the that the forest, the jungle was full of bandits and robbers and wild animals and and ghosts and spirits. It was a very, very different place to be, and of, and almost an inverse of how how we experience it today. Um, and it's as I said yesterday, it's this journey from the known to the unknown. Uh, there's this letting this leaving behind the, uh, the confines of something. Um, and in this particular case, you know, as I've said, it's the confines of, um, of social duty, of responsibility, of um, f literally following in the father's footsteps. You know, the destiny is, 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 is mapped out. Um, I mentioned Prince Harry yesterday, and a similar interesting similar archetypal narrative going on about someone choosing to take a different path and uh, and the difficulties and the pain of that because um, I find it interesting this this detail about the horse dying I mean, it's such a poignant image about the horse dying of a broken heart and I, I said on the first day about viewing the story as if every character had a significance, um, not just looking at Gotama himself. Um, and the horse, I think, really embodies the grief, the sadness, that the letting go, there's always going to be a grief, there's always going to be a, a sadness in a going forth, there's always going to be a, let, a leaving behind. And I think it's really, really important that that's acknowledged. Um, I, I'm not sure where it came from, but the, the term necessary betrayals came to me. That sometimes there are necessary betrayals. Um, I find it interesting in the Christian myth, you know, there's no redemption without Judas's betrayal of Christ. It's a, there's absolutely no redemption, <laughs> you know, it doesn't happen if he's not betrayed by Judas. So there seems to be a necessity for betrayal. And some of you may know that, that James Hillman essay on betrayal um, that's very significant where he talks about this. Um, that's not to say, you know, one has to deliberately go and betray people, but, there, but the, the death of the horse does seem to illustrate that there's, um, there's a grief involved. There's, um, there will be a grief and there will be a sadness. Because um, I think one way we avoid this is by demonising. Um, we, we make, it, it's, it's kind of easier, I think, sometimes to make the, the, the other the, entirely kind of bad, entirely kind of wrong. Um, and because we don't have to deal with the, the complex feelings that that stirs up, because they, they, there will be a mixture of feelings. And I think that does need to be acknowledged, tough though it is, tough though it is. Because grief also suggests love. There's no, there's no grief without love. You don't grieve what you don't love. So the two, unfortunately, are two sides of the same coin. When we love, we grieve. That's um, that's the nature of it, I'm afraid, folks. Um, so, and then, interestingly enough, um, Gotama uh, removes his clothing, and he—I uh, don't think I even mentioned it, did I? <laughs> Rather important point. I, I didn't mention his cutting off the hair. <laughs> Uh, I mentioned the taking of the off of the clothes, but I didn't mention the cutting of the hair. Very, very important point, the, uh, the cutting of the hair. He cuts his, he's got this kind of royal top knot that he cuts off. 
and um, sometimes it's illustrated that he's um, you know he's got his kind of royal sword and he holds his top knot up and cuts it off and um, Sabuti makes a really interesting point that he wonders if this is where we get the image of uh, Manjushri from with his sword of wisdom holding above his head whether that kind of comes from the, the going forth and the cutting of the hair because this cutting of the hair um, I think is very very significant um, hair is interesting stuff I was reflecting on this the other day and um, you know, in some workplaces, if they do uh, drug testing, they uh, they take a sample of your hair because if you've um, if you taken drugs, it will it will still be in the hair. It will still be in the hair. So hair holds history. It's kind of it holds our history. Hair it literally does. And, you know, get DNA from from hair. Um, in fact, you can always get the whole person from a strand of hair. Um, so it's interesting, this kind of removing of the history, this kind of taking off and putting down of the history. Um, and, and of course, in so many, I was talking about rites of passage, and in, in a lot of rites of passage, these transitional points, um, the hair is removed or changed in some way. Um, you know, like prisoners have their heads shaved. Um, Joining the armed forces, often there's a, there's a shaving of the head, and this removing of the clothes and the um, and the putting on of a uniform of some form, whether it's a prison uniform or an army uniform or whatever. There's a suggestion of of letting go of an old identity, and in that particular in those particular kind of um, initiations, as it were, uh, in terms of being a prisoner it's a kind of um it's a uh what's the word uh a, a, a nullification of your identity you know it's a kind of you know you, you you've done wrong you no longer kind of matter um and in the uh, armed forces there's this idea that your individual identity is now subservient to to the group to to the the unit the outfit the army um, so you're giving up your kind of individuality for, for, for the group. But we've also, you know, it's interesting that the classic, they've, um, the end of a relationship, the new haircut the, the, at the end of a relationship, it's, it's again, it's, it's, the same, uh, it's the same archetypal pattern um, beginning again. Um, I, I shave my head. I make sure I shave my head at sort of significant turning points. Um, and sometimes it's interesting how I've done that even unconsciously in my life that I've, I've shaved my head and it's almost like the next day something significant has happened there's been this sort of rite of passage into something else um, time's a curious thing so the hair, the giving up of the hair and the clothes has this sense of the, the dropping of an old identity the dropping of this uh, the the responsibilities of um, of caste, of family duty, of tradition, of joining the family business, of um, of this sort of weight of history, and there's a certain sort of anonymity that comes with it, a certain sort of freedom. It's it's interesting. Babies don't have hair, do they? I wonder if there's a if there's a sort of sense of being reborn. A sense of rebirth, you know, you're you're, you're entering the world um, again. There's there's a rebirth, and it's it's interesting, isn't it, that these um, in the uh, true Ratner ordination, uh, quite often people shave their heads. Uh, not everyone, but also we have this um, initiation vase where we have uh, water dropped on our heads as part of the public ordination. And so similar to the Christian christening, this um, the uh, the washing away, the, uh, the the sense of being uh, reborn, a sense of uh, initiation through water, and there's a lot of this in the um, in Gautama's life to come, 
the the fact that there's um, there's a ritual bathing that happens before a significant turning point. Um, I'll say more about this later, but there's um, there's a ritual bathing that again there's a sense of rejuvenation, a sense of of, of, of being reborn. And I think it's very important to see that there's this moving away from and there's also a moving towards. So Gautama is going to join this um, community of wandering uh, ascetics who, as I said, you know, meditate, debate, discuss, um, do all sorts of strange practices that we'll go into tomorrow, um, or strange from, again, strange from my perspective from modern Britain. Um, but there's a very, very, I mean, Northern India at this time is an absolute kind of um, philosophical kind of uh, hotbed of, of, of debate and spiritual ideas and discussions and there's this idea of the axial age that at this time there was this extraordinary um, ferment of, of ideas and discussion going on uh, not only in northern India but in Greece um, uh, with the birth of Christianity um, there's all this kind of so it's been dubbed the axial age that there was sort of almost a, a a huge kind of shift going on and Gota was going to join that he's almost joining um, what we might see now as a sort of counterculture there's a sort of counterculture outside of civilization there are these sort of long-haired weirdos um, who, who, who don't who are sort of almost antisocial you know, some of them don't wash, they, they let their hair grow, they don't follow the etiquette, they're quite wild. They, some of them um, almost deliberately take on practices that are against the uh, cultural taboos of the time. Um, so it's very much this kind of rich counterculture going on that, that he's, he's becoming a part of. Um, you know, there's, there's, it is interesting, there's these alternative ways of living, there's debate, there's experimentation, some of them are, you know, there's, there's mind-altering practices going on, they're, they're interesting parallels with, 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 with other countercultures. Um, but there's this move from, from what Sankar Akshita might term the group to what he called the positive group. Um, and any group of people will have a certain dynamic to it that's often quite unhealthy. Um, but hopefully you can be a bit more aware of those unhealthy dynamics and you can consciously work with them. That hopefully happens in, in what he termed the, the positive group, the, the Sangha being a positive group, where, we're, where you join a community that acknowledges your individuality, yet also... Uh, supports and encourages what you could um, say about finding uh, what used to be termed you know supportive conditions positive conditions for practice uh, I'm sure all of you have experienced that relief of um, in, in different contexts I'm sure of finding like-minded spirits and souls that you can communicate with about the things that really matter you can communicate with about the things that are really significant to you. Um, and the support that that gives. Um, and again, I find this quite interesting because um, it's, it's a certain sort of going beyond a fixed self to realise that we need supportive conditions, that we need other people, that, that we need help. And there's a sort of humility um that we need to acknowledge that that we can't go it alone we're not these kind of um superheroes you know who don't need any help um we need other people we need support we need um, fellow practitioners of the dharma and in a sense i wonder whether this is what gotham is looking for 
he doesn't seem to be able to find it in the palace. Um, the way it's presented, the, pal the palace is a place of pleasure and status and tradition and, um, you know, not asking the difficult questions, not digging too deep, go back to sleep. Um, but Gotama's had this, the beginnings of an awakening. Um, and as I said yesterday, it's, it's very hard to go back to sleep once you've had that experience. You almost have to work really, really hard. So Gotama is heading off into the into the forest, into the jungle, into this uh, counterculture, this hotbed of uh, discussion and debate. And uh, it must be very, in some ways, incredibly lonely experience as well, because he's, he's left behind um, an awful lot. And there's going to be sadness there, I'm sure. I mentioned yesterday this line from a David White poem where he talks about experiencing his adult aloneness. And I, I get a sense of um, Gotama walking into the night. I think uh, that must have been such an acute experience of his adult aloneness. And um, but also of some of of somebody really taking responsibility for themselves. Really, really taking responsibility for themselves. And just to say there is there is though um leaping forward, there is what I would term the return journey. Um after the awakening he does return to the palace. He does return to his family. Um, his wife asks for him to honour her forbearance um, and her fidelity by, by returning again, uh, which he does. And uh, famously, Rahula asks for his inheritance um, and the Buddha, who now is, gives him his real inheritance, which is the Dharma, and Rahula becomes a monk. In fact, virtually, if the accounts are to be believed, um, the entire family all join the Sangha, join the monastic Sangha at some point, um, including his stepmother, who, um, legend has it, becomes the first nun and leads to the ordination of women. Um, and uh, he also returns to... Um, to see his father when he dies. And, and there's a very poignant, I find this really poignant, that um, he, after the awakening, he goes up to the uh, Tisha Heaven to see his deceased mum. Um, I just find that really, really sweet, <laughs> that he goes and sees his dear old mum um, and uh, makes sure she's all right up in her heaven. It's like kind of going to visit someone in a care home or something late in life. It's, it's something really, really poignant about that image for me. He goes to see his dear old mum. Um, but I wonder if this is, a, an, if this is an image of, of reintegration. He, he comes back into relationship with, he comes back into it in a new relationship. And, and some of you... I'm sure have experienced this where you you maybe step away from something and then you return and you you reorientate you rework out your relationship and um, hopefully hopefully you can do that I mean we all have it don't we when we um, when we leave home and um, we, we we return to be in relationship with our parents and sometimes bless them our parents still relate to us either as, you know, well, at varying, varying ages we're, we're related to. And, you, and it is hard. You get this in families, don't you? You can see within families there's often a script and you've got your role and your part and woe betide you if you um, stray off that script, if you, if you play, want to play a different part. You're, you're always the one who, you know, in certain in my experience um so there's this sense of um ideally 
um, of coming back into a into a healthier, more more adult, uh, more individuated relationship with with our history, with with and that might be literally worked out in our relationship to our family, but it might be an internal process of um, renegotiating our own relationship with our own history. Um, there's that old aphorism about it's never too late to have a happy childhood. Um, we, we can re-relate to our own experience. Um, that sounds a bit simplistic, but I think it's pointing to the fact that that we can we can these things the past isn't fixed. It's our relationship with the past. It's our relationship that the past isn't a fixed thing. It, memory is not a fixed thing. There's very very interesting research going on at the moment about just how subjective memory is. A memory can change. And our relationship to memory can change. So I wonder, in a way, this, this reintegration that takes place suggests a, 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 re, a renegotiation with our history, with who we are, of our identity. And there seems to be this sort of, I mean, they're quite literally, in the Buddha's case, there's this sort of drawing together and they all join the Sangha. Whether it was quite as neat as that, I don't know, but... Um, but I think within the image is a suggestion of reintegration. And just to, to, to finish off, um, this, you could see the going forth as uh, what's termed the path of transformation, as opposed to the four sights, which you could describe as the path of vision. Uh, Dharma practice is often um, divided into these two paths, as it were, as in we have the path of vision, we have an experience of something, we have a kind of a, a seeing, um, an insight, as it were, into something. And that changes us in some way. And then, and then on the basis of that, we then need to act, we then need to live our lives. And in some ways, that's the really tough bit. Um, that's living out the insight is, is, is the bit that's really challenging. Um, there's that famous line from W.B. Yeats, the uh, Irish poet, in dreams begin responsibilities. In dreams begin responsibilities. So we have that experience of insight and then we need to live it out. And that's tough. That really, that really is. That, that's, that's where the work is. Um, but it's this, again, it's always this journey from contraction to expansion, from closeness to openness, from a smaller perspective to a bigger perspective, from from what they call the Zen tradition, small mind to big mind, from the condition to the unconditioned. That's, that's, that's the movement, that's the going forth. It's that stepping into the unknown um, that is the really significant, uh, which is, is the way the key to this is this stepping out. That Joe Jackson song, Stepping Out, has been going around, around my mind. Um, actually, lots of songs have been going around my mind. Talking Heads, Once in a Lifetime, you know. Also talking about, you know, how did I get in this, how did I get here? I've got this big house, this big car. There must be more to life than this. And he has that experience. And there's a river flowing underground. There's a sense of something other that's drawing, drawing him on in the song. Um, such an archetypal motif. But just as a final caveat, um, I think the going forth can very easily be used as a justification for immaturity, for not honouring one's responsibilities. Um, it's the danger of what I call becoming the perpetual spiritual student of, of never quite, quite growing up. Um, this kind of 
a misunderstanding of non-attachment as being a life of irresponsibility, that somehow you're too sort of spiritual for the mundane world or something. Um, it's one of the reasons why um, Sankarachita would always um, promote the idea of the path of responsibility, about really, really taking responsibility. You might not have a family, but you take on some sort of other responsibility that's beyond yourself. Um, you really you know, take your place in the world um, and you, yeah, you bear that adult responsibility um, because I do think that, that, is, that there is a path of, of, of going beyond self through, through responsibility. But somehow, and this is, I can't say I've mastered this art myself, the, the art of responsibility without unhealthy attachment, uh, the middle way between those two. Um, yeah, that's, that's, that's the practice, really. Um, so maybe I'll just finish with a poem. Um, it's a very strong poem. But um, I think it speaks volumes. Some of you may know it. It's um, by Mary Oliver. And then we'll have a, we'll have a break, and I'll work out my timings in a moment. So this is the journey by Mary Oliver. One day you finally knew what you had to do and began. Though the voices around you kept shouting their bad advice. Though the whole house began to tremble and you felt the old tug at your ankles. Mend my life, each voice cried. But you didn't stop. You knew what you had to do. Though the wind pried with its stiff fingers at the very foundations. Though their melancholy was terrible, it was late, sorry, it was already late enough on a wild night, and the road full of fallen branches and stones. But little by little, as you left their voices behind, their stars began to burn through the sheets of clouds. And there was a new voice which you slowly recognised as your own, that kept you company as you strode deeper and deeper into the world, determined to do the only thing you could do, determined to save the only life you could save. 